All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for uh, joining us. And we are again very excited to have you here participating in Walkthroughs. Um, Walkthroughs is an online series of events, and our response to the current chaotic situation, I must say. Um, while we are not in a position to organize proper exhibitions in a proper space, we decided to go digital and virtual and have artists that every week put a headset on, share the screen and walk us through their, their VR work. Um, artists are engaged in a conversation with a curator. Um, and by the way, if you like this format and would like to see more of these, do let us know in the comments. Uh, we may have more walkthroughs in the upcoming weeks. Um, now, I'm really, really happy to have here today Pastor Placek and Juliette Bibas for the second act of the series. And uh, I, will, I will briefly introduce them. Uh, Pastor Placek uh, is, is uh, an artist duo, um, Melanie and Quentin, um, Melanie Cortina and Quentin Dubre. They incorporate multimedia through their work, questioning the relationship to new digital frontiers through mixed realities and moving image. Uh, their work has been exhibited nationally and internationally in Paris, Tokyo, Brussels, and Lausanne. Uh, Julie Bibas has been creating connections and opportunities between artists, festivals, and cultural actors. She regularly collaborates with several international artists during their existing project, as well as developing and conceptual conceptualizing new creations. Um, Juliette has been the head of studio Johnny Le Mercier, based in Brussels since 2013. And uh, since 2016, she has been working as an independent curator for several festivals and cultural institutions. In 2019, she founded Salon Brussels, a network for, for women working in the arts. Uh, I am George Vitale. I'm a cre creative director and exhibition maker based in Berlin. My products evolves around the role and influence of technology on society through the lens of art and the eyes of the artist. In 2017, I founded Synthesis, which is a VR virtual reality-based experimental art gallery located in Berlin. Um, now, I would like to um, give you a quick overview of the structure of today's talk. We will start off with playing a short teaser of the, um, the work that, that the artists are presenting today. Uh, the work is named I Never Promise You a Garden. Melanie and Quentin will then introduce the work for us and with Juliette and I engaging in a conversation with them. At the end of the session, we will open the floor to a QA. and a uh, Feel free to leave your questions for the panelists in the comment section, either on Zoom or Facebook. I will check both regularly. Um, Melanie, Quentin, shall we start? Sure. So, stop the teaser and restart it again because we um juliette and i and apparently the uh, the, the the audience um, we can only see a black screen so we'll probably have to restart it again yes perfect now it's visible okay so I'm trying to share the screen again maybe i can let's stop instead of yes here it is perfect yes thanks no, then it's black screen again. Ah, no, no, it's good. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
Quentin, why would you? Why don't you introduce the the, the work to us? Uh, well, I, I can start. And then you. Um, uh, well, it's a VR interactive piece um, where the player, let's say we like to say the player, um, is invited to interact with the hanging garden, and depending on its on his interactions with the garden. Um, the garden will fade or stay in, let's say, a stable um, state or keep flourishing, keep bloom, blooming and blooming basically forever. If um, the more you interact with it, the more it blooms and the less, if you don't, let's say, if you don't interact with it, it just dies and fades away at some point. Um. Let, let, let's start with the questions. I, I'm, I'm curious to ask, um, what motivated you to work on I Never Promise You a Garden? What was the original artistic inspirations? And um, are there any artists, writers, or poets who have influenced like your work? Mm, so I did first idea behind I Never Promised Your Garden was um, a statement. Uh, we noticed um, when we created the garden in 2017 that um, the, the way people uh, used to interact with uh, interactive pieces, more spe specifically uh, virtual reality, was very passive. Um, people used to um, used to be maybe more influenced by movies and just stayed um, passive. They looked at a VR piece, um, moved a bit their head, but that was it, even when there was um, some interactive devices inside. So that's why um, I first created uh, an interactive piece in which you have to keep engaging um, with the elements, with the flowers to um, to continue uh, the experience and um, so, so it would be a very generous experience for the for the people who who are willing to interact and at the contrary um, for the people who are making the conscious choice to not interact and to say stay, stay passive um, they will have a very deceptive experience um, so this um, this is how the project started, and then um, uh, so it started 2017 uh, when I was at Ekal in Switzerland, um, and then uh, we met in Paris and uh, shared the same point of view um, regarding VR and uh, interaction. So we decided to modify it uh, technically using um, a lip motion, so uh, an infrared camera, in order to track the hands of the players. Um, and also we added a, a lot more, um, um, more flowers and uh, we, we thought, um, reshaped the garden a bit and uh, decided to put it um, on show for the public. We showed it uh, in several festivals and uh, to several different um, audience, um, 
audiences, audiences um, from different nationalities and different uh, uh, contexts, uh, such as uh, more uh, video game audiences, more artistic audiences, to, to see how they will react um, with the garden. Uh, maybe you can tell more about the inspirations or something. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's always a tough one. Because, like uh, maybe, maybe instead of just uh, inspirations, um, you already mentioned, Melanie, this idea of, um, of uh, almost forcing the audience to engage in your piece. Was that a reaction you had also, seeing that people were easily very passive when experiencing VR? Yeah, it was a reaction. Um, Right now, it's, uh, it's not the same. I think we've seen a lot more of interactive uh, pieces using virtual reality in which the, the player understands that he has to interact to keep the story flowing and uh, the narrative uh, um, moving on. But at this, uh, at this point, in 2017, yes, it was something, uh, it was really a reaction of uh, what I could, I could see. Um, with past VR experiences. There was some kind of frustration uh, seeing people just missing the point of, uh, of a virtual reality experience. Yeah, so you, you just for the people who maybe are, are joining uh, in, in the middle of our discussion, so in the piece of uh, Quentin and Melanie, you're immersed in a natural environment and if you don't do anything, the, uh, the nature, the flowers will die, whereas if you, if you keep moving and interacting with the, the, this imaginary garden, then the, the, the garden will bloom and flower um, indefinitely. So um, in my... Uh, feeling of your piece is that you're giving uh, the audience the power of time uh, to control time and also to control uh, life and death. What would you say about that? Uh, yeah, well, that's uh, that's what what's also interesting about it is that it's very we don't have absolute control on it at all. Like people, um, there's always a part of. Uh, Something, anything, I mean, the time, yeah, as you said, the time, it can last two minutes or 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending. So every time it's hard for exhibition spaces to comprehend sometimes also mm -hmm. because they, they're not used to it necessarily. They always ask for the, the lamps and we say, well, there's no lamps. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, it's very, that's what it's all about also is that you don't want a one single narrative sequence where the public, the audience would have to fit in. You know, they would have to make, what's interesting is that they can make their own, basically. And there's not only, there's not one single uh, narrative sequence, basically. Everyone has its own. And that's what we are looking for in our work is to, where we want to go is where is give the, abi the ability to people, for people to, to feel and be immersed uh, through also through their own narrative sequence and uh, a unique experience every time. So yeah, that's very much uh, inspired by video games basically. And uh, and for example, the garden. If it were if it were a video game, I mean, if we were to speak in terms of with the video game language, it would be a one button game. But it's uh, well, obviously, much more than that. <laughs> but it's something. Quentin, why don't you um, start the, with a walkthrough so that we can actually see the work as you know, as it's uh, like um, uh, experienced in in VR. Yeah. Sure, sure. And then I have a, a quick question for you. Like going back to what um, Juliette asked regarding. Um, you know, the garden and the interaction, you know, if you interact, the garden blooms, otherwise it fades and dies. Um, I find, I uh, mean, did you, yeah, go ahead, share the screen so you can like, okay, um, yeah. everyone can see the, yeah. Perfect. Um, so what I, what I find really interesting in your work is like this sort of like call uh, for responsibility towards nature in a way it's like it empowers a lot to the viewer 
because of course it's like it's beautiful to see these um, garden like growing and flourishing and there was this very uh, you know important um important key um you know key team related to nature you know um is it is that something that uh, you know um was one of the drivers of your work like this call for responsibility towards nature and the environment well, she, she wanna... well um, it's, it depends i mean it's, it's it looks obvious that it's a direct straight uh, reference to nature but it's also very uh, there's a huge uh, i would say it's very uh, um, there's some, some uh, it's the contrary, I mean, uh, sorry, I can't find the word, the exact word, but um, it's how, no matter how obvious it may look, it's not necessarily what it's about. I mean, it's, um, it's a bit like, I would say, uh, because if you were talking about the references we have, it's a bit like Derek Jarman's garden in a way, I mean, it's, it looks like a garden, but there's like this big power plant, nuclear power plant in the background, but that's also what it is. It, it's, yeah, it's about nature somehow, but it's uh, speaking about nature and VR is also very uh, contradictory in a way, you know, because it's, uh, well, I don't think, and yeah, about about that, you you really claim that you you're using a, a digital aesthetic. You're not trying to have a, a close to reality type of aesthetic with your uh, flowers and plants. No, not not at all. I mean, it's um, it's uh, we we try. I mean, it might. It's not even. It's not trying to be literal. I mean, it's not. If it was, if it were like trying to be to behave and look like a garden. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be this way basically because it's just instant instant instantaneous. I mean, you just touch the flower, it blooms. I mean, it's uh, and it somehow refers to it, but not wanting to look be a lookalike. And um, I don't know. If you, I mean, maybe I didn't really catch the question. <laughs> Sorry. What what are you trying to say by uh, by by using this very digital aesthetic? These like uh, I would almost say fake flowers. Uh, do you want to um, say that you're not trying to mimic uh, reality and nature and really create your imaginary uh, virtual digital garden, or is there some other reasons that made you use this type of aesthetic? Well, definitely, we think that um, right now. Um, right now and even in 2017, going for a very um, literal and uh, well, mimicking the reality would be pointless because of the technology. Um, there, were, there will always be uh, proof that you're not, uh, you might be immersed in an universe, but everything will, will show you that uh, it's a fake, uh, it's, a, it's a virtual um, experience. So yeah, that, that's why we, we don't go for uh, 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 realism. Yeah, hyper realism. Because it's hyper not realism. Right. Yeah, it's not a, it's not only it's not just about because when you're in immersed in it in VR, yeah, it's not it's never gonna be it's never gonna try to look more real than than, than the real. You know, if mm. you never reach that, it's just mm. you you might see things that you just you know. You can't, you can't smell it, you can touch, you cannot touch it. Even if you have, you develop something with haptic responses and stuff like that, you just, then the, 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 the technology becomes heavier and heavier, the more you want to try and mimic reality. I mean, if you start having vans and smell and, it, and fake smells, and this is, uh, at some point, this is becoming really, really heavy in any, in uh, every sense of, uh, in sense of it. So, no, it's just, uh, it's, that's not what we want. We are looking to do. It's uh, not trying to be realistic in any way. I mean, you can see right now. I mean, none of, uh, especially. I mean, some of them are the flowers are, that are just not really um, not looking like real flowers, but it's more like we are. If we were speaking still of, about uh, references, it would be more something like those uh, ignites. 
photo, photographs of flowers or, or uh, Peter Saville also works on flowers. So it's more of an interpretation purely. George, did, did, should I continue on the questions? Yeah, for sure, we can go ahead. Sure. Something, something we haven't uh, talked about yet, uh, and that is visible in your in your teaser. I I believe it's going to be difficult to grasp for for the audience today, but it's the scenography part of your piece uh, because it's very important in 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 this piece that it's not only a VR project for the person in the VR headset, but it's also presented in a way um, that the rest of the audience can see it. So to describe it to the people who are with us today, there is the person doing the VR experience that is in, in the middle of the space, but then you can see uh, uh, the garden being projected on the person and on a screen behind this person so that the people who maybe are not uh, excited about VR or also the people waiting to do the experience also get to see the type of garden that uh, you created. Um, I, I am, as a curator, I'm, I've, I've been pushing for a long time for VR to have this like uh, scenographied aspect to, to go on the opposite side of these like VR events where you have people uh, sitting in chairs and, and like the, the dystopian uh, vision of VR that is very scary. So can you tell us more about how you wanted it to also be um, a physical installation in space? Well, it's totally true for us, the context of, the, of this piece is as important as the, uh, the content of um, what's inside the headset. I think it's important today to, um, to give, to tease the audience uh, about what's inside uh, the experience, but not to spoil it. So, um, what, what you can see right now on the screen is what, uh, what you could see if you had the headset on, um, but what uh, the, the audience um, can see, the people who are maybe uh, waiting to see uh, to, for... Uh, waiting in line. Yeah, waiting in line. Um, we put a camera inside the scene. Um, let's say if I have the headset on, um, here, the camera will be there, so... Um, so on top, right? Because there, there's no point um, for a waiting audience to, um, to find and see exactly what they're going to see inside the headset. It, um, as you could see on the trailer, it's more... Um, uh, it's it's a, in between space. Is it, right? Oh, I mean, it's, it's just like an, like an in-between space where you don't, you have to have a, you have to have an experience, but not yet what, what you're gonna see uh, mm -hmm. in, in the headset. But you still, you need to. The experience starts here. It doesn't start once the headset is on because you already yeah. are. Quentin, in fact, if I may like interrupt you, it's like it's interesting because I like to say that the experience inside the VR begins as as the experience outside ends. And this is what I truly like about your work, in a way that you initiate the viewer um, to the inside experience via the outside experience. I think that's 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 really, really important. It seems to be like a key factor in your work. Yeah, this in-between space uh, is, uh, is really important. It's not just because every headset, maybe for the audience, looks the same, black or white. Um, um, maybe when, when, you're, uh, when you're wishing to try virtual reality, you will try it once. Maybe you won't like the experience once and you will be uh, disappointed or, uh, or just uh, you, you feel like you know what you're expecting. Um, so thinking about how to present uh, the garden um, was really, really important. Is there, um, is there like, uh, what are you hoping like the, the viewers, like what kind of response uh, has your work like uh, triggered in the viewers? Is there like a particular kind of response that uh, you were expecting to see uh, in the, like in the viewers interaction? Well, I mean, I have, I have, yeah, we, 
I mean, some examples here, people start moving very slowly on this album. They really, really move very gently and slowly, like they're going to break something. Uh, I mean, they're touching the develop, punching the flowers, obviously. And, so, and most, because, I mean, every time people sit down and just watch it die at some point, and uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of unexpected. At first, it wasn't expected, but it was uh, very common. But um, yeah, yeah, so that's mainly, I mean, I don't know if you have other examples. But, uh, yeah, what was interesting to me um, was that as uh, this interactive uh, experience doesn't use controllers, your hands, your hands are, uh, are free. Um, I like to focus on the gesture people, people do, and they tend to caress the flowers, not be just like this. Um, and usually, the, if they come alone and they know nobody is watching, no, um, like if they don't come with friend or family, and they feel um, they feel really immersed, and they don't feel like behaving for the audience, uh, they will spend more time in it. Um, and at the contrary, if they are coming with friends, they're, they're, if there is a group or something, they will be less uh, at ease, and they will be maybe be more uh, in control. Yeah, they, they will, yeah, in self-aware, definitely, um, and they will like to uh, to behave a bit more. They won't sit down. They won't. Uh, they will maybe touch the flower a bit quickly. Um, but the people coming by themselves usually take the time to free um, experience um, the whole experience. It's interesting what you're saying. Uh, I noticed that uh, VR tends to make uh, people, so let's say like a more general audience, not people like us who are very much used to this type of technology. So a general audience, I think, are very often uh, shy uh, in reaction to VR. So like uh, they're a bit scared and they don't really know what, what to do. And, and uh, then, of course, there is this idea of people looking at you with a headset and you always feel a bit stupid and, and you know, not, not knowing where your body is in space. And I think it's super important what we mentioned a little bit that it's funny because when we talked together, we just talked about the little uh, explanation you give at the beginning uh, where you tell people how, how the garden works, which is like so, so rare, I think, in, in, in interactive experience to take the time to explain people uh, what's going to happen. But I realize now with what you said before that even this um, where you're presenting it in space allows the person that is waiting like this person knows, ah, okay, I'm gonna go in a garden. So at least it's the first step. And then when you finally get the VR headset, someone is explaining what to do. And also this fact that you, you added the, the video feedback of uh, seeing your hands in the space, that it would have been easy to make it disappear and, and the images would have been more beautiful. But I think it's necessary for people to see their hands in this virtual world. So I think it's important to underline that there is uh, strong decisions uh, you made as artists to take the people by the hand to bring them into your world. And that is still very rare, especially in VR. Thank you. That's very important to us. And I think we were inspired by um, video games tutorials. Um, it's really important to show the, the public how to how uh, to, to, get, to give us, um, to give them the keys on uh, this, uh, this new world. No, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's there. I mean, the important, the key thing, I mean, you want, people want to feel immersed in it. So you need to give them the right key, the keys to do, to do so. And instance, I mean, if they need to, I mean, it's already, it's so, uh, it's so, not convenient. I mean, the headset in itself. I mean, it's something that for people who are really not used to, but even for people who are actually used to, it's always a bit tricky. You know, you have to feel, uh, to, you know, you, it's not natural. So the more you take them by the hand, yeah, and you explain, and they know they can enjoy the experience once they put the headset on and they have no. 
that they are not just wandering around, around not, not knowing what to do, basically. So it needs to be quite clear and quite simple. And the, 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 apps, the, the, the lack of controllers, physical controllers, and holding plastic in your hands is even better because you, 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 you don't need, at some point, you lose this self-awareness. And this is what's great about VR is when you reach that point, it doesn't necessarily last a long time, but when you reach this point, it becomes very, very cool basically. So that's, uh, that's why also we make this effort to explain, um, make this sort of tutorial approach to the, the content. One of the one of the participants is asking uh, some. I was just go gonna ask the same thing. So thanks, uh, Salome, for bringing it up. Uh, I think it's so rare to uh, hear artists uh, uh, using the reference of video games and being proud to compare themselves to video games. Is this something common in your practice? Um, what do you mean? Is it, is it something we can find in, in other projects that you've done uh, that there's inspiration from video games? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, I think we are what we, what we experience. We, watch, we read books and uh, watch movies and play video games in our free times. It's not just uh, for work or for uh, interaction design uh, um, inspiration. So, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, I think we have a lot, of, a lot to learn from uh, video games. A lot of talented people are already thinking about how to interact, how to, to behave. And uh, especially in virtual reality, uh, there are video games uh, in, your, in virtual reality which has, are really fantastic. We have, so yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, you have to realize, maybe, you, maybe, maybe from your perspective, you don't realize it, Melanie, but I think there is a tendency to look down, like being an artist, you, ha you would have to look down at video games at being like not uh, good enough. And like, for example, when you studied in school, was video games a reference? Uh, for me, yeah. But yeah, but from the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, straight to the point. Um, no, it wasn't really a reference. It, um, you're definitely right about uh, video games being looked down by some part of the community, maybe. But that's so bizarre. That's so uh, schizophrenic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not every reference should be uh, poets and, uh, and uh, philosophy. I mean, it can be more trivial. And uh, yeah, yeah. Can I? Um, I'm curious to ask. Um, I'm curious to ask more questions regarding the interaction because you mentioned before the hands and the controllers. In the in the teaser, we saw that uh, you attach. It's very, this is something very unusual. You attach the controller to the wrist. Um, while usually, you know, in VR, people hold the controllers in in their hands. I was just wondering why is it that? Why did you choose that? Um. Well, I mean, it's, it's always, I mean, it's been, I mean, this, this video is from the, I mean, this was, let's say, the first version of the, of I never promised you a garden, but the, the hands were perceived by the, the player in the, in the virtual world. They were just, they were not moving, they were able to move, so they were like fixed gloves, fixed gloves, and the, so yeah, so it's quite cool, but it's not in good, not good enough because then we we removed it to, in order to replace it with the the infrared camera where you, you can see that the hands and the fingers, everything is moving, and this is, these are your real hands. But uh, yeah, it's much better to to use this. I mean, you want to feel that you don't want usually video games. Let's go back to video games, you have a, you're watching a screen and the, the link between you and what you're watching is the controller. So you're holding a controller that yes. like a pass, a pass, like a bridge between you and the, 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 the game basically. While the good thing about VR is that you can basically get rid of it at some point. The, there's no need for a controller, you become the controller basically because mm -hmm. you all kind of walking around your hands are uh, triggering things in the in the space and there is no you don't have to learn which button yeah. 
leads to what action, or you just do everything naturally and instant, instantly and, and instinctively. Sorry, and um, yeah, so that's basically the the idea behind it is to to be to be more. I mean, not yeah, not to feel you, when there well there there could be no need of something where you just you just get rid of it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a completely different question. Um, I was wondering what would be the ideal or the dream context for you to present this piece? Maybe it, uh, it has happened already or maybe not yet. Um, so do you have one in mind? The, the, the perfect conditions would be um, um, a lot of, of room. Yeah. 16 square meters. <laughs> That's uh, what we are working with, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's such a, it's a very greedy uh, experience in a way. It could be, much, uh, could be much bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be, could be much bigger. But uh, usually we, um, we need um, um, a room uh, with no sound and uh, a dark room also with a lot of space, free space, so the people won't, uh, will be able to freely roam around the space. Um, so the, the, where yeah, I can, I can imagine that you can very quickly completely forget about time, but uh, very quickly be limited in, in walking around the garden before hitting the walls of the room. Um, yeah, if there, yeah. what to avoid. I mean, what's worse than being immersed in virtual reality and uh, feeling like the, 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 the reality um, takes you knocking from, from yeah, knocking the table or... Uh, yeah. Oh, that's the worst. Uh, that's what we want to avoid. Uh, All right, so we are running a little bit out of time, but we got some questions from the audience. Uh, perhaps, uh, Quentin, you could uh, you could um, actually let's see. let me find it. Uh, Yes, he says. Uh, Antoine is asking. Um, he's curious to learn, like to to learn more about your thought that went into the sound design, uh, in particular with regard to the ideas of nature and digital nature. Sound design regarding nature. Oh, um, I can I can maybe answer that. Um, to be honest, the sound design was um, is pretty simple. Um, there is variations uh, around uh, um, the, the, not the music. Notes. Notes, yeah. There is one sound that the flowers make when they appear. So it's, it's really specialized, so you can know where a flower is, is, uh, is coming to life. There's another sound they make when you touch it, and another one when they die. Um, and uh, this is, um, and each sound has been moduled, so it's never exactly the same um, when one dies and, uh, and fades out. But there was no um, inspiration from digital nature. It was, if I if I understand the question. But it's a bit like a UI UX design. Yeah. Uh, in terms of sound, when you need to. You need to understand what, when when a flower dies. You need to be able to understand yes. to understand it. So the sound has to match this idea. So the thing is that basically when a yeah. the, the when the flower blooms, that it makes a sound, and it's, it's supposed to be the opposite sound um, in a way when when it dies. So it's, it's I think it's more like practical uh, choice. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's more like when you design uh, when people design UI and UX. Uh, interfaces basically um, they the sound needs to, to match the ID the, the, the interaction so so that's more about the the way through sound design to make you understand what interaction you made or what's going on around you because sometimes when you're surrounded with the garden you hear some of the flowers die and fade away and you can you get it through the sound because you don't necessarily see them but you can hear them so mm. this, each flower has its uh, emits its own sound bank, let's say. I mean, its own, mm. its own sounds. Okay. 
Yeah, Quentin, perhaps you could stop the screen sharing so people can actually see you guys and, and we can continue with the, we have uh, two interesting questions from the audience. So the first one is related to, um, to you and um, to the two of you. How do you work as a duo? Uh, Victoria is asking, do you each take certain responsibilities or is it completely um, collaborative? And uh, um, Sarah is asking, um, do you think that, you know, what do you think about VR in more traditional museums? Um, do you think it will renew the approach um, that, that, uh, that museum uses um, to, to, you know, to showcase art? I guess she's just um, talking in general. Um, so there are two questions. You want to answer? One for each. One, yes. <laughs> well, wait, that's the thing because it's uh, yeah we are. But I mean, quickly uh, regarding just quickly regarding the, the way our the way we work basically is that we don't have any roles. We don't attribute any roles in particular. Like there is no um, there is no need for that. We are more at ease with some things. Technically speaking, most of the time we think about the projects together. But then when it comes to um, Develop the projects in terms of um, in the technical for technical matters. Then we split the work with what we are more comfortable with. And uh, but other than that, no, we don't say uh, we don't have any labels and saying you know, this is your job and this is mine. And uh, we do we just, depends. It, it's just it's uh, it's never been any it's never been a, an issue or just a, we never really. Of course, both of us have uh, has strength. And uh, weaknesses, but usually, uh, usually, yeah, we take turns. Yeah, so I mean, that's uh, that's. Uh, and yeah. about the, question, the Sarah's question. Um, yes. Yeah. Regarding the current situation with the coronavirus, uh, virtual reality uh, in a public space is really a tough subject, a tough question because of uh, hygiene. Uh, I mean, not everyone is going to, to wish uh, to put headsets on um, that has touched the eyes and the, the face of someone you don't know. Um, so it's, a, it's really a, a tricky question right now. We think uh, this has a lot, it could offer a lot uh, regarding museums and um, um, cultural places, spaces, but right now it's it's something we have to, to consider. Um, Is there, like this question, there is another question from, from Olivia who connects very well to what you just said. Are you thinking of about potential like socially distant or remote access like adaptations of this project? Um, well, I mean, we've thought about it a, few, uh, a, a while ago. I mean, but the thing is that Regarding the I never promised your garden. I mean, it's it's. I mean, the technical needs that are required to um, make sure that the experience is um, is can be exper I mean, can be played in good conditions. It's not. I mean, it's still it's a bit too tricky to let it come. I mean, to play it through a domestic environment. Mm. Because you need you need space, you need technical gear that are not really between anyone's hands. Yeah, you, you, we also talked about how the physical setup is part of the piece for you, and and how it's not because it it's not because it's digital and 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 it could be on a virtual platform that that it has to become something someone can look on a really shitty Samsung headset from from sitting in his like chair uh, without the rest of the the experience it, I think it's very important to tell people and to explain people that you know the setup the the other screen having the body in the middle of the space this is what what creates the immersion it's not because you put a headset on your face so so it's a, it's a whole, it's, a, it's as important as, the, as what you see in VR. I have a practical question on this aspect. Did it ever happen to you that for some practical reasons, uh, people who uh, showed your piece asked you to make it shorter, like to have a control on how many people per minute would experience the piece? 
um, never that directly, but of course we had uh, every time someone, not every time, but it happened that people wanted to exhibit it and oh, but we just have like five square meters. Oh, will it work on? Um, it's not about time, basically. No, it's, it's, it's never about space. time. It's more about space <laughs> and uh, are, are you sure you need that much uh, space in the dark room and silence and usually it's more uh, this problem. Space is more an issue than time. But it was always okay that uh, there would be, there could be one person every 15 minutes, which is not a lot, you know, like, like for someone who has a festival with uh, hundreds or thousands of people, having just one viewer every 15 minutes is not much. It was okay. 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 Yeah. yeah, it's just... Uh, so the plasticity of time is easier than the plasticity of space. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 but it's funny because we thought we actually thought like, I mean, we thought it would be an issue, a time would be an issue in most cases, but not at all, it was more literally the space, uh, and maybe one, um, I would say 90% of the time, space is an issue, but not. <laughs> be, 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 before we um, wrap everything up, uh, last question from the audience, which requires a very uh, quick answer. Uh, how long did this project take to complete? Um, of course, I don't know. I mean, actually, we work it on it uh, on different periods of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's did, you, did you have to, uh, to make it evolve on different VR uh, evolutions? We had to make it evolve regarding the, the sensors. Uh, of course, sensors, because as soon as the leap motion, uh, the little infrared camera, allowed us to get rid of the, the live trackers and bracelets we, uh, we did it. Um, I mean, actually, we also made it, we also made it improve. I mean, actually, it's the third version, basically, now. And it's, um, no, it, it requires now, the third version is uh, more, uh, let, let's say, greedy in terms of, uh, of uh, hardware. Because uh, we want it to be, we want it to be bigger and more, you know. Uh, I mean, just bigger and, and very responsive. Like you can touch any flower, and it will, it will flow. Um, yeah. So, yeah it's, uh, it's, uh, so we don't, we don't really count the time spent on the, on this, but it's. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's been much more than uh, expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, we, we reached the end. Um, I want to thank very, very much uh, Juliette, Quentin, and Melanie, also known as Pastor Placek. This was really, like, really great. Thank you so much. Um, we will be back next week on May 8th uh, with another walkthrough with Khan Buyuk Berber and Jesse Damiani. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you then. And thank you again, guys. Thank you, thank you Josh. everyone thank you who joined. Thank you for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye.